I've done everything here from fix the espresso machines to, to plunge the toilets to Speak everything. Speak on that because I talk about this at VaynerMedia. The reason I'm always calm is I know if, every, if David starts a coup and takes every employee with him, I have no fear because I know how to do every job. Yes. I think a lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake. Vayner Nation, I'm extremely excited. I'm actually excited because visually, this will be an interesting episode as well, so go check YouTube if you wanna watch this one because we're in this incredible setting here in Midtown Manhattan with a fellow entrepreneur from the East Coast I admire very much, Gregory's Coffee. I actually tell the story pretty often when I talk about Vayner Media, like how we moved offices, and Gregory's Coffee is actually in that story because when we moved to uh, 23rd, 24th and Park, literally every day. It was kind of like when we started to somewhat grow up into like the alpha, not just complete scrap in the mud ridiculousness of the first couple of years. Every day there'd be a hundred Gregory's Coffee's cups because everybody would go downstairs multiple times a day. And so we are here to talk to Gregory from Gregory's Coffee, really talk about entrepreneurship, his journey. I want you to know about him because I think a lot of you actually should be going on a similar path. And we're also here to talk about the incredible V Friends, Gregory Coffee's collaboration. Gregory and I just did a Good Day New York, but we're really excited about the Jolly Jacko pumpkin spice chai latte collab that we're doing that's running here in October. So if you're visiting New York City, get to a Gregory's, find a Jolly Jacko beverage, pick up a collectible sticker, flip it on eBay or whatever else. And so I've just been really fun. We're about a week in seeing all the tweets and the pictures of people having this cup in their hand, the QR code. We'll get into all of that and more, but first let me say hello to Gregory. How are you, my friend? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm good. Why don't you tell the Vayner Nation a little bit about yourself, literally comic book number one. Take the floor for two, three minutes, four minutes. Where you grew up, what kind of kid were you? Just give us the zero to day one of opening your first Gregory's kind of story. Let's ground you for the audience. Son of an immigrant, you know, my father came here uh, from Greece at a young age. My Both my parents are from Brooklyn. That's where I started my journey. Sort of grew up in this sort of New York entrepreneurial household. So my father was a serial entrepreneur, left college to, to pursue his dream, which was running his own business. So he was working at a donut shop at the time when the opportunity was there to take over that. He decided to leave school, take over that donut shop, and that was the first of his many forays into the food and beverage world here in New York City. So, Where um, was that donut shop? That was all the way down in like Bensonhurst area. I believe it's still there, but it's probably changed names quite a few times since then. But he went on from donuts to the classic New York City delis you probably saw all over the city in the 90s. They sell, yep. sold everything. When I was probably in my teens, he, he had launched this panini press sandwich concept, which there was about seven of them at their peak. So I sort of grew up watching my father um, grind. grind every day. You know, probably didn't get to see him as much as I would have liked, but he was that was the, the deal back then. Plus, like, not as convenient now with phones and connectivity. So definitely loved my summers, going to work with him. Tell stories of when I was seven. He used to have me down in lower Manhattan doing deliveries for him in the summer. Uh, so he had a store down by Wall Street. He'd send me to send bacon, egg, and cheese and coffee across the street, and I'd show up with my Yankee hat, little kid, and these people would be surprised to see their delivery boy probably being uh, in second grade. Uh, I have a son who's now eight, and I could never imagine him letting him <laughs> loose in lower Manhattan, but my father Did thought it was epic, a good idea. I mean, you got, I got good some tips, tips, right? I mean, yeah. I mean Down inflation in Wall Street, at the time, seven, you know. I probably got two bucks, and I thought I was the richest guy in the world, but uh, at the time, I didn't realize what was happening, but my father was sort of giving me a lot of the tools that would later help me in life, which was, you know, showing about hard work, dedication, all the experience in F&B. So, I mean, my whole life is not necessarily about F&B, but it has really been the fabric. Were, you, were you a good student? Or were I you, was. So, okay, so um, you were getting good grades, good working grades. for dad's stuff. In I the mean, my dad or... also, immigrant family, good grades were... That a was real it. thing. It was like, you know, if I got a 97, it wasn't great. It's like, what'd you get wrong? You know, I got um, very fortunate. I got very bad grades. And I was born in the Soviet mm, Union. So mm. I'm like first gen. But my and my mom would ground me, but there wasn't that, which is so common in immigrant families. My mom didn't play that game. She had a different point of view that I had it. And she wanted me to be accountable to bad grades. But it's really been interesting as I got older, I didn't realize that I was in an incredibly small minority of immigrant families where the mom and my dad worked, like it sounds like the way your dad did. And my dad wouldn't have known if I got A's, F's, or Z's or W's, mm -hmm. like had no clue. But my mom, she grounded me for every bad report card, which was four times a year, mm -hmm. though the summer one, she was lenient a couple of days and I'd go out and play. Mm -hmm. So there, the pressure to get good grades was there. Yes. And did school come easy to you or did you have to really work at it to get those 97s? 
it's it's odd to say, but it did come easy to me. No, I ask um, it that way because there are just a lot of people who are naturally good at school. They understand the system. They understand what they need to do. I, I was able to achieve, you know, good grades. I was, uh, you know, top of my class even in college in the honors program at Boston University Undergraduate Business School. Um, Ironically, and, I was about to reference my brother AJ, who barely worked and got great grades, and he went to BU as well. Oh, really? So maybe and there's they, a trend there. You know? uh, but uh, I did enjoy my time at BU, but also probably the one time it caught up with me was law school, where I was able to manage time and, you know, get the grades I always expected, but then I get to law school, and the workload was so much more, I couldn't just approach it the same way I had done previously. So when I went to, got to law school, that first semester when I was getting towards finals, I was realizing it was a little uh, different. Yeah. Um, I still wound up doing well, but it was just, for it was me, it was, it was a transition as to how to approach it. And that was probably the most pivotal time for me learning that I couldn't just rely on natural ability that, or, you know, ability to kind of think recall it. things, think yep. through things. Law school taught me <laughs> you have to work really, really hard if you want to achieve what you really expect to. It also taught me about writing and a lot of things that also, for whatever reason, in business and all these things, wasn't, business school wasn't as critical. So Did you go to law school thinking you were gonna practice law? I did. You um, did? Yeah. Oh, interesting, go so ahead. So again, I, did, I went to school not thinking I was gonna work in the, the food and beverage industry. It wasn't necessarily cool back then. Yeah, uh, it wasn't. I, you know, you'd go to work for my dad, I'd come home smelling like grease with ripped jeans, but not because it was cool because they got caught on a nail at, at work, <laughs> you know, and it was like, you know, not glamorous. Not, you know, I admired my father, but it wasn't something that I... You felt there was almost like most immigrant families, when dad or mom is working in that environment, there's almost this subconscious, if not outwardly conscious conversation of like, well, you're gonna use this as a stepping stone yes. and you're gonna do this more bougie thing. Oh, my mother cried when I told her I wasn't gonna be a lawyer. Cried. Uh, my grandmother, years after I, I completed law school and I was working at Gregory's, used to call me her grandson the lawyer because they were that mentality of I get it. office job, professional, uh, whereas the stigma about being an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur in the food business did not have the same sort of cachet. I, t I tell a lot of kids now, you can't imagine what being a chef means today compared to 25 oh years ago. God. Being a chef 25 years ago was the help. Exactly. Yeah. Now there's celebrity chefs and, you know, cul the culinary explosion in our society and that's wonderful, thank God. But like, to your point, I'm very aware of, you know, it, it seems crazy. How long ago was this? When did you start Gregory's? 17 years. Yeah, I mean like, it's just actually profound to think about entrepreneurship and food and beverage entrepreneurs rebranding in our society today as like completely the other side of the pillow. I think it started with fast casual. Yeah, I think that's Just right. literally the, the nomenclature getting away from fast food where you could start saying things that people used to associate with just quick service, you yeah. know, grabbing a salad, grabbing a, a yeah. coffee to now it's an elevated experience and they started designating it as fast casual or fine casual, whatever yeah. it was. But getting away from, oh, it's just like another, you know, deli, you know, McDonald's-esque type How? business. So you're in law school. Yeah. I assume there's the great entrepreneurial story. Like, what's the moment that you're yeah. like, fuck this, I'm doing Gregory's? I was working my first law job for summer after school. They offered me a position and I kept saying to myself, I can do this job. It was, it, this was then kind of reverted to how things were in the past. They would give me a mountain of work in their eyes. I would complete it in two hours and then I would go back and be like, what else do I have to do? It just felt very easy to me what the tasks they were giving me to complete. So I felt like I could do that job. I could make money doing it. I really had no passion for it. The more I was in it, I was like, this just feels like work and it wasn't something I enjoyed to do. I kept saying, you know, my whole life, seeing my father run his own businesses, I guess there was a, this thing in the back of my mind that maybe one day I would open my own business. I didn't know what it was. So I stopped and said, you know, I've got all this experience. I've been doing this thing my whole life, but I've always been working at my father's locations thinking I'm helping my dad, not could this be something I actually want to do For as myself. a career. So it was the moment of, Talking to my father saying like, you know, I don't think I want to practice law. He had one of his locations. It was a sandwich shop literally across the street from my law school. So I was a customer my first year. He needed help. He needed a manager. So would you let me run the store? He thought it was a little odd request. Um, but at first he's like, if this is what you really want to do, sure. So my grades did suffer second year when I did that. But the business picked up quite a bit under my, you know, tutelage. Le leadership tutelage. I realized I was good at it mainly because I had been doing it my whole life. 
sort of that Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours. I realized I literally from shaving carrots when I was five, making deliveries when I was seven, Brother, watching all things it, my it, dad it's did. It's so crazy. We were literally just downstairs getting some coffees while the team here was prepping upstairs. I can't go into an establishment like this and not pay attention to POS, to how fast is the register moving. Think about the thing you know the most and think about how you look at it versus people that know nothing about it. For, I'll give you an example. Somewhere in my mid 20s, late 20s, I was like, wait a minute. Look at all these people at this restaurant, the way they're drinking wine. They're drinking like water. They're not even thinking. I would take like an eight minute like thought process of like smelling it, tasting it. It was like consumed me. Or like when I watch the Jets and like I watch casual people, like you just, when you know something so much better than the rest. So for me, retail and restaurants and things of that nature, I don't walk in and order a coffee. I walk in and order a Gregory's coffee, a Jolly Jacko, pumpkin spice uh, chai latte. I also though am watching the staff, trying to figure out why the POS is doing what it's doing, thinking about how clean the store is, which is an incredible challenge in New York City, it was hard enough in New Jersey in the suburbs, traffic, like watching how people were walking by the street and curious if they would like look at the storefront, notice like 30 of them looking at their phone, was like, oh right, like storefront re real estate is kind of like outdoor media. Like 50 years ago, this like your, the signage in your store converted better than it does now because people are looking at the phone. Just all these random things that like literally ran through my mind in two seconds downstairs. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it, honestly, as we've expanded, sometimes it can be a problem because if I haven't been to a store for a long time, sometimes I may have this anxiety as to what am I going to see because I know I have these sensors that start firing. The minute I walk in, it's like, that's not correct. My father, this has, is... my father has one store every day. He's really just unhappy on his drive to work, which is 45 minutes because basically he knows he's gonna walk in and see something he doesn't like. And he's got one store and he's there every day. So for you, having dozens. There's an appreciation effect because my team knows that like I am I will lift them up. There's things that they're working hard. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are newer at this, some of them are doing it for a while, but even that, you can get blinders if you go to the same spot every single day. So when I come in and I give, it, I give feedback or point things out that maybe they were missing, it's they all with the mindset of just, yeah, like we're, I'm, I'm not here well, trying to catch them do something wrong. That's based on delivery. This goes exactly. back to candor. Like I think about kind candor versus not kind candor. Everyone listening knows owner, manager, who's got a bunch of stores. We've all seen the cliche. We all are thinking what I'm about to say, which is that boss that walks in when she or he's going to look at all 10 stores and just starts yelling and, and leads by fear. Yeah. And I think- I don't think know, I've ever yelled in the 17 years how about your dad? Was he a little more old school? No. And that wasn't his disposition either. He worked as hard or harder than anybody there. And he has people who've been working with him for 40 years. They've literally, the people yeah. that have stayed with him in a food and beverage establishment, which is Hardcore. probably the most rare. Of course. And I always took that, which was three people with respect. Let's, let's, let's bring some value to everybody who's listening and managing. Let's stay on this for a second. What do you think in the 17 years that you've been running this. Actually, let's context it for everybody. Gregory's Coffee, how many locations, which which states? 36, about to open number 37. Where? Um, in Darien, Connecticut. Um, actually, we're having our final inspections right now, so I do have a little bit in Good the back luck. of my mind. Hopefully, it's going okay up there. Oh, trust um, me, I'm thinking about nine other things <laughs> while we're doing this. Go ahead. But we're in New York, uh, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Washington, D.C. Uh, Love so, it. so 36 Northeast. today, hopefully 37 by the end of the week. Any plans for any extra states as you... Yeah, yeah, a little, um, little Rhode Island, a little Boston, a little This This, little this Northeast Mid-Atlantic yeah. corridor certainly is in right in my wheelhouse. My in-laws are up in Rhode Island, so they talk, ask me all the time. We definitely love to get down to that Virginia market. So yeah, kind of bridging that this gap. Northeast 95 so quarter. So in the 17 years from location one, which was what? 2006, 24th and Park, first no one. No kidding, yeah. ours? Yes. No, no yes. Sounds, isn't that what's so funny? Notice what I just said, that was so weird, ours. ours yeah. That's amazing, okay, from that store, to the one you're about to open in Connecticut. What do you think from day one, because you like me had a lot of training as a kid, from day one was your biggest strength that you continue to be great at, or you've doubled down or refined? And what do you think was your biggest weakness in hindsight that you've been able to close the gap on? And even above and beyond that, if you wanna talk about that one or something else, what is the thing that, can, that you're still potentially struggling with as a manager of such a conglomerate? So I think my biggest strength from all along was just my passion, my dedication, my unwillingness to let things go awry. So I'm just- You willed it. Yes, I've willed certain things into existence by sheer 
efforts. By, Intestinal fortitude. Yeah, I would, you know, my team would probably tell you, I'm, you know, the first Larry Bird, I'm the first guy, I am yep. I am in our stores with somebody who works for VaynerMedia, uh, yep. but our Greenwich location, David, yep. every, every morning they David open Rossum. the door, they open the doors, I'm there minutes before or after they open, so six in the morning, and then I'm here, at, you know, six, seven, eight o'clock at night, whatever it is, I'm usually the one turning off the lights, and that's, and then weekends too. If anybody needs me, I'm always available. My wife might have, might have a few things to say about my uh, uh, unfettered it's, availability, it's, it's but it's my hard. team feels it, and yep. they appreciate it. Yep. So I think there's a lot of things that I've just been unwilling to let fail, yep. um, and my team feels that. I think it kind of might tie into my biggest weakness, which is sometimes my inability to let others do, do their yeah. thing, give them the room. What is the balance of micromanaging or coming in and being the leader? That's the balance you've been struggling with at times, right? Yeah, I mean, and I think a lot of it is, um, we were sm small for a long time. I mean, we had 18 locations and there was probably three total corporate employees, including myself. It's only recently where we've even started to expand in a corporate team and where I've started to have others who are capable of taking no, but, on responsibilities. But, but, I, but I think people need to hear this who judge like work ethic or judge what you're talking about now. I think everybody who's listening and hit me up on Twitter, Gary VEE, if you agree with this. If you own a business, it is, like a dog, it's like a child, it's your baby. You know, obviously that resonates with me. I don't view you as like this crazy guy. What I view that as, I get it. This is like part of your family. When people don't have a business and aren't entrepreneurs, I'm incredibly empathetic that they don't understand in the same way I'll make the one that I do think people understand. For all the people right now who have a dog, who judge or laugh at their friends who don't understand, because they don't have a dog, what it feels like to be a dog owner and what it feels like and why you cry when the dog passes away or is sick. It's a family member. Believe it or not, that is what a business is to a true bred entrepreneur. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly how people refer to me as Greg from Gregory's. I am, this business is an extension of me as a person. Well, you're person. the logo. Exactly, it's I mean, hard to get away I'm, from it, you know? I'm pretty um, impressed with that. I'm like actually thinking about rebranding VaynerMedia. <laughs> I think Gary B needs to take over for the very, 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 very lucky black hat. I like, I look at the logo here and I'm like, you know what? I think he figured it out. So I think you kind of hit it a little bit there, but that uh, the, the allowing or the, you know, giving others some of the things that, again, I have, Another gift and a curse is I've done everything here from fix the espresso machines huge, to, to plunge the toilets to Speak everything. Speak on that because I talk about this at VaynerMedia. The reason I'm always calm is I know if every if David, our friend Rossiter, starts a coup and takes every employee with him, I have no fear because I know how to do every job. Yes. I think a lot of entrepreneurs make that mistake. For sure. I mean, even my father would tell me when we started roasting our own coffee, he's like, don't forget, <laughs> you need to know how to do that too in the event something ever happened, because that's his old immigrant mentality too. Maybe he's last trained line. That's me. right, you're the last line of defense. Whatever happens. I mean, there's been times where like, I had to drive the truck, right? Like the that's delivery, right. we couldn't deliver. It's like, well, am I gonna open tomorrow? There's, I remember a major snowstorm, probably like 2011, 12, where the city got shut down. My store on 44th and 6th, it's all hotels on that block. Nobody could leave, everything was shut down. My store, we were baking everything out of our store on uh, 24th and Park at the time in the basement. There were people that all the hotels couldn't get any food. So we baked the, the product at 24th and Park. I put on like snowsuit, carried it like to a subway, got there, carried it through more snow. And people were like grabbing food out of my, my hands, Bad. out of the baskets, because they literally had nothing to eat on that block. And I'm like, I'm walking in, you know, carrying as much product as I could. And my team was like surprised, right? That I, I would do this, but I'm like, who else is gonna do this? Cause I, I literally, it's hard for me to sit and watch something not what? happen if I have the ability to, to make it, it fixed. I told a story for a long time. My most famous wine library story is a woman in Bergen County getting a delivery to the wrong place of Behringer White Zinfandel, which is $3 a bottle a $36 case of wine, misdelivered. She calls and complains. It's in December with bad weather. Mm -hmm. It's one of the busiest days in the store. I am the disproportionate leading salesperson in the store. Like every third customer that was gonna spend two, $3,000 on collectible wine came in and says, where's Gary? Is Gary here? Where's Gary? And I knew that I had a moment where I did it for two reasons. One, this lady, the, I'm sorry, the, her son called and was really complaining because she was really upset because she needed her Behringer White Zinfandel for the holidays. 
she was elderly in her 90s, and I knew that it was an opportunity for me to show that customer over everything, no matter what kind of customer, and I took a case of Behringer from the warehouse downstairs, threw it in my car, drove to Bergen County, delivered it to her, and came back, missed an hour and a half, lost tens of thousands of dollars in revenue potential during that time, but it became a story that became connective tissue for my company to speak about like exactly what you're saying. If you as a leader are able to fix, I think too many leaders would rather blame their team for it not working than jumping in and getting dirty and fixing it. Oh yeah, I mean, there's a book that my priest had recommended to me at one point and then kind of really struck a tone with me called Extreme Ownership. I don't know if you've heard of it. Mm, I can't read for shit, which is why they get the grades. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, the concept that it says is that if if something is within your control, like within your four walls or your, your sphere of influence, and you can't on and if something doesn't go right and you can't honestly say i did everything in my power to make this have worked well then you should look at yourself and say it's on me it's not on them 100%. so you know i sort of taken that to heart where i don't like classing blame i'm i'm right in the trenches with everybody else so if well, i especially can't, when you're the owner founder like you are like you hired those people right like when i look at my incredible team that i'm looking at right now like these six people like i hired them and if i you know cuz even if it's indirectly, Sid who runs the team, if he's hired one of the individuals here, well, I hired him to hire them. I will never understand this obsession of blame when you have full control. What's the easy route, right? Well, I could always just point the finger and say- What's well, a societal issue? I mean, I believe that so much of our unhappiness right now is predicated on that. You wanna blame the mayor of New York, you wanna blame the president, you wanna blame a, a party, you wanna blame social media, you wanna blame... I had a friend who's bl spent the entire 30 minutes blaming social media and the mainstream media. And I'm like, what about you? Like, like, what what are you consuming? I mean, we experienced this early, mid to late kind of COVID, where there was a I was doing the thing where I was blaming COVID on issues we were experiencing. Well, oh well, well this store might be slow because of COVID, or that's happening because of COVID. And then I felt like, well, what am I up. doing? Good for I'm you. saying like, you Good know, for you. there's people in the street. If they're not coming in. They're going somewhere else. They're going somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. And it must be something we're doing or not doing. So it caused us to kind of look. We made adjustments, tweaked, and what was know, the biggest tweak you made in that scenario? I mean, our our cool. food, our, our food program, our customer service, just how we you it. even how we packed bags to like how we made it easy for people to to access things. So we had to move things around, rearrange, even uh, reconfigure our menu to you know. There's points where there's just less options available, so people were looking for a one stop. People used to be comfortable bouncing to two or three different places to get their coffee from here, sandwich from here, muffin from there. Got now it. it's like, I don't have the time, nor do I have the interest in going. So like, how can we update what we did to make it more appealing to what people would today are looking for? Even like we were talking about delivery, right? Like we didn't, we weren't very good at delivery because we didn't do very much of it. We weren't packing them very well. They would show up and product would spill just because it wasn't- It wasn't in your core competency. We would maybe get one or two deliveries a day pre-COVID. Now it's like dozens a day per store. So we had to get better at it. You know, now those scores uh, have gotten significantly better. Let's talk about collaborations. Since we have one together with Be Friends and this Jolly Jacko pumpkin spice chai latte. Delicious, go get one. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty like pumped with the feedback of the, I, you know, everyone thinks their baby is the best looking, so I'm not gonna judge on how delicious this is. I'm just reading Twitter, and you and the team have done a great job. Clearly you people call like Twitter it. Twitter is it still Twitter? I just call it Twitter forever, I'm old school. So like, like, I still say tweets, but I'm like, what do you say? Am I doing an X? Am I I'm Xing something out? I don't know, yeah, I, I, I'm I just, really lost that has to, how to describe this. Yeah, I'm just very comfortable calling it Twitter, but I'll change if the world wants it. I'm consumer centric. <laughs> how do you think about collaborations when was your first collaboration, if you can recall? Why do collaborations? How should people that are listening right now that may have a business that is in the kind of demo that is possible to do collaborations, even if they have one store or one product, I think collabs are very interesting. And I, I wonder how you think about it and how, what's the history of collabs? So uh, to me, Collaborations have to make sense. You have to have people or working with somebody that is of like mind, which is why this made so much sense to me, just for everything you stand for aligns very closely with what we stand for. And there's a lot of times like, oh, this is a great business opportunity, right? The, sure. This person has reached, but it's kind of like how we create a blend. Like you might, wine I'm sure is very similar when you're talking about how do you, what are you looking for the end product, right? So when we're talking about coffee, I want 
rich flavor, unique flavors, crisp, clean, balanced, sweetness. It's hard sometimes to find one single coffee that can give me everything I want. It's almost impossible. So, the best wines in the world always blend multiple grapes. Almost always. Most people don't know that. And same with coffee. I mean, maybe because we out and out call them blends. I want this, my house blend, my dark roast blend. But it's like, how can I find individual components that when you put them together, give me the end result that I'm looking for. So similarly with the collaboration, it's like, how can I find partners or people or whatever it is that can help us become a better version of ourselves or expand our reach or to connect with people that- Or perhaps... delight your customers, right? Exactly. Yeah. There's certain people that maybe they love V friends. They're ingesting VaynerMedia or you or your content and Maybe they were aware of Gregory's, maybe not. Somebody um, somebody drove from South Carolina to be one of your DC locations. <laughs> that's crazy. You know, that's cool stuff, right? Like you just those things add up. I mean, of course, and it's just like, but I'm not again. It's not just about like, the business not. or the dollars. It's of like how not. do you do things that make sense if it was that just resonate? Business and do dollars, you would go for the for the entity, whether that's someone like Taylor Swift or like a media outlet that can just drive the most business. When it doesn't fit. It, the consumer can smell it. I'm kind of in, I mean, I like fashion too. I've okay. been doing, I've been in like magazines, whatever, just because people- Just I being have a handsome, like you're a model or? <laughs> I have friends that work in that business, so they like to tap me when they need 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 somebody to do interesting whatever from time to time. Interesting uh, modeling? I oh, modeling, so it's like I've been in like GQ for like, as like guys of New York and how they yeah, dress model, and stuff yeah. like that. So it's, yeah. yeah. But there's been times I've been approached by a brand to do, you know, either an ambassadorship or a campaign. And if that brand is something I would never actually wear you or I just do don't like, I'm like, there's like the money. I'm like, yeah, they want to pay me or they're sure. going to do this. It's transactional. But I'm like, it just doesn't feel right because it's also like. What was the first collab you did at Gregory's? Do you remember? I'm trying to think. Or at least one of the early ones that you can remember in. I mean, we partnered with people. Influencers? And Influencers, like. Did anything surprise you early on when the influencer thing was just starting to happen where you're like, holy crap, I can't believe that person drove so much or, any, or anything interest, to any, honest, interesting? To be honest, there wasn't any collab that changed us materially, but I think also we weren't do we haven't been doing it right. This is different because there's like a, a prolonged period. There's a tail. There's a lot of work that's going into it. And this yep. is honestly a learning experience for me too because we've done these one-offs uh, or single events and there's no tail to it. So you might see a single pop on one day, people are driving people in, but then there's not a continued effect where right. I'm seeing a lasting. Right, impact. you might get some new discovery. Somebody might have realized there's a location, but it's micro, whereas this, this podcast, what we just did with Good Day New York, that kind of like the way we're doing exactly. the content. Like we worked with Coriz, which is a, a, a Greek facial care company. That's cool. I'm Greek. Yeah, I get it. They connected. So we we're like, oh, we want to do something. So they, we did this huge activation on one day. They had samples and product at all the stores and giveaways and this kind of stuff. And that day we saw a lot of, of att attention. But then the next day it was like. Right back to normal. Right back, right? Yeah, so yeah. we've learned that. The, the one day one off might not be the exact. Hard. Yeah. Or, or we did with some of these big social influencers around events. Um, and we'll definitely drive traffic. But if you're not doing a prolonged, continuous yeah. effort. What I like about this, I always think about collabs for me, for everyone who's listening. I'm like, I need them to feel like that was the best decision they made. What I liked about this was, as you recall, one of my requests is like, hey, I really want it to be a new drink. Like just slapping my my Jolly Jacko on. A, Wouldn't make a, any a, sense. Exactly, it doesn't feel authentic in reverse. What I was excited about, even when we were talking the first time, and definitely now that I'm seeing the response, I'm like, oh, sure, we may decide to keep doing this every season, but even if we don't, because we don't want to, or you don't, because you don't want to, it's not right, you now have a formula that you may want to use as just your, and to me, like I'm like, that would be worth it for them. For everyone who's listening, basically every collab I do, I basically make pretend I'm fully the other person, and what would I say yes to? I'm blown away. The word collab, collaboration, please go Google it. Because what I see from a lot of you when you try to do a collaboration is you try to win the deal. It's what about me? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, go, go search it, go understand the word. And th that was a big part of me. One, I really wanted it because I wanted it to be unique, but I also knew in the back of my mind, well, if they crush it, and I know they do a good job over there, they may, th that just might become a thing they sell. Definitely there's things like that where we've tested it. We have a few menu items that were seasonal or tried something out and they just don't leave the menu because they're really great. And Again, something like this, marrying two products, our, our chai and our, uh, our pumpkin spice that people love both on their own. So put yeah. them together and yeah, it's working really well. I'm pumped about that.
Talk to me about, and you may have no answer for this, but since we are talking about, you know, for everybody who's listening, what, what's really developing in VFriends land is collectability. This podcast is coming out just as Comic-Con is probably either happening or it's happening at the end of this week into the weekend. One thing that's been, blew me away with VFriends is collectible pins. If everybody right now, like, in parallel to listening to this, goes to eBay and types in VFriends pins, completed items sold, you'll be blown away, like, just wild. Because I didn't grow up collecting pins, though I knew Olympic pins and Disney pins were a thing. Obviously something I grew up very much collecting, trading cards. The VFriends trading cards thing is going bananas right now. Also go to eBay and look that up. Well, Sanan's coming on screen here, here we go. Nice little pin. <laughs> oh, there nice. it is. This is nice. This is the comic, co- this is pretty cool. So yeah. anyway, how about for you? As a kid, Gregory, did you collect comics, Magic the Gathering, Pokemon, sports cards, sneakers, anything, or you were a non-collector? So I collected sports cards, and I was always, I mean, we didn't talk about it earlier, but I definitely played every sport out there, soccer, basketball, um, track, baseball. What were you best at? Probably best at soccer. I played that my whole life. I probably, I mean, I probably enjoyed that the most, but maybe my most success was throwing javelin in high school, oddly enough. I transitioned from running, uh, doing the mile to, yeah, launching a spear. It it just seemed like really cool um, when I was in freshman. When they they line everybody up and like, all right, everybody's gonna run a sprint, long distance, start throwing some stuff, jumping and see what you're good at. And they gave me, they gave me a football as like a, and I I launched it like 15 yards farther than the starting quarterback of the high high school team at the time. So like, all right, this guy, you should throw javelin. And then like, uh, got into it. I loved it, but the, the 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 quarterback wound up quitting the team because he couldn't bear the fact that varsity quarterback couldn't throw it as far as this nine year old, hundred forty pound freshman. So anyway, that was I was so like, wait, hold uh, on, Gregory, I'm not letting this go. You're <laughs> telling me your freshman year as a ninth grader, you threw the football further than the starting quarterback, and that forced him to quit. Yeah. You might need to write a book about this. <laughs> so you collect so sports cards. So I collect sports cards. To this day, a huge sports guy. Love it. Definitely was bit by the sneaker bug in college. So my father, immigrant, could never uh, justify paying money for sneakers. So I had one pair, whatever, reasonable. For the whole year, yep. I was I loved Jordan sneakers growing up, but I never owned a pair. Yep. So the minute I got to college, I went on eBay whatever money that might have been allocated for food, I portioned some out to make sure I could buy a pair of Jordan 3s and from there it was a problem for a while. <laughs> um, and I'm, I still have a few of those from that are still wearable. Uh, don't wear them as frequently, but uh, started a journey of being interested in, in that and then clothes, which led to you know being connected with some of the fashion community and stuff like that. But today I don't collect as many things, yep. I would say, but- Art? I wish I could, but I, I well, admire you Well, let's talk about that for a second. This is something I'm very passionate about. You answered it like most people will. I wish I could, but I think you know this. Like I believe, and I talk about this in marketing, underpriced attention. For me, it's more exciting to find some sort of ad on Pinterest right now that nobody sees than buying a Super Bowl ad. And that's how I think about collecting. Of course, people collect different ways and different budgets, but con- let's talk about art, especially contemporary art. Right now, there are three contemporary artists in Manhattan who she and he are making art. Nobody gives a shit. It is super inexpensive, hundreds of dollars, maybe a thousand or so. And literally they are destined to be wildly collected, heavily collected over the next two or three decades. And I think for anybody with sports cards, NFTs, pins, comic books, like there's always a moment in every genre, sneakers right now, that people are not, like you, you think you know what's gonna be collected, but you don't always know. And so I encourage you to consider that it's not. That I'll you have to... for the right places to look, for sure, to yeah. find some of these things, because I've done it too. There's like, you know, Raph Simmons is a designer, yep. and there's, some of his pieces are extremely collectible, and I purchased a sweater on grailed.com at one point. Mm-hmm. Um, I paid, what at the time I thought was way too much for it, but I was like, it's worth it because it was a collector's piece. And I literally tripled my money on a sweater. So this is clearly your fashion love, like collecting clothes and handbags and all that stuff has become very, very, very big. Like, is that something that you might start doing? I do, I mean, I do. I, I, but you I, wear it, right? I wear it. I mean, I have things in my closet for 10, 15, 20 years that I still wear. And some of them are worth a lot of money just cool. because of time and yeah, the vintage things clothes have thing changed or like rad. Tom Brown is a designer that yep. people love. I have stuff from like 2007 or eight when he First was, was still up. very early in what he was doing. Then those pieces 
are, are important to other people. Yeah. yeah. Super cool. What did we not touch on? Anything you want to talk about the formula? Anything you want to talk about the locations? Anything about Gregory's or anything else for the general entrepreneurs and operators that are listening? Yeah, I mean, I think when I think about starting Gregory's, even running it today, or when people ask me, like, what made you want to start this? Or how do you still stay passionate about it? I think it's, A, making sure what you're doing you love and you, you're not, again, doing it just to chase dollars. Because anytime you're just trying to make money doing something, it's going to yeah, be very hard to be hard. successful in it. It's the biggest um, mistake, don't you agree? Yeah. It's the thing I put out my, uh, the most about on content. Because it's like if you're passionate and you love something, like I said earlier, you're gonna you're gonna make work. sure it does well. It's not a guarantee, but you're much higher likelihood of success you're if you genuinely harder. love it. Because yeah. like I'm like gonna it. put the hours in, not because I might make an extra fifty dollars today, or my, it's because I know the business needs it and I want to give it what it needs. You know, having something that you care about, you're passionate about, truly understanding your position and staying true to that. Like, you know, we say our, our tagline is see coffee differently. You know, what does that mean to me? It's like, I don't want to do things just like everybody else does. When people come to Gregory's or we call them regulars, like our, our regulars, <laughs> um, it's like, what do they appreciate? It's like that old New York sensibility that I had running my father's places was, it had to be delicious. You had to get it quick, had to have great hot. customer service, had to be hot, and the place had to be clean. If you could do all those things at the same time, you had something. For me, in coffee, that was very hard to find. It's, a lot of places make great cup of coffee. A lot of places can move quickly. Not everybody can do them both at the same time while also delivering it with great customer service. All those things you mentioned, you yep. look at the POS, yep. how quickly are people moving? All those things add up to the overall experience, which is, again, what I think about all the time. And I walk into my stores, uh, and it's like, I want to make sure I'm seeing all those pieces adding up together to see coffee differently like every we want to do every single day. So, yeah, it's the passion, the drive, the care, the love. And then at the end of the day, when it affords me to be able to, like, collab with someone like you and your great team and great products, uh, people driving a uh, long time to get some collectible <laughs> pieces and scan this and see some Easter egg videos and whatnot. It's so fun. And just see how, how much things can develop over time. Uh, and I never would have thought... 16, 17 years ago, I'd be talking about Gregory's and, you know, scanning QR codes. And opening up your, th hopefully, as we're sitting here, your 37th? 37th, getting, 37th yeah. 37th I mean, getting approved? Just getting the one going was, like, all I cared about that at the of time. Of course. And then, and then it's like, well, well, maybe we could do more. And then it's like, well, maybe this can go further. And it was like, well, why am I still in New York? We could try this in D.C. It was 2017, and then it just it goes from there. Where can people find more information about Gregory's? So all of our handles are at Gregory's Coffee, uh, G-R-E-G-O-R-Y-S, no apostrophe, coffee, uh, um, gregoryscoffee.com. You can find us. You guys app it up? Do you have an app? We do have an app. You can order ahead, uh, order delivery. Do you There's become loyalty. a regular on that app? The minute you sign up, you're mm -hmm. regular. You're part of like us. That. Part of your joining the fam. So, yeah, you can find us on, on socials, on the web. Hit mm -hmm. our app up. If you're in the city, you know, we have... You know, all of our products we make ourselves. Like I said earlier, like on the drive well, to give everybody context, on the drive from Good Day New York, we drove together, and I was telling him I wanted to pay him a compliment. When we moved that VaynerMedia office, I was eating an obnoxious amount of soft carbs at this point in my life, which means like baked goods, and I was blown away by the presentation and just really the softness, aka freshness, of the products and the baking program, the bakery program at Gregory's. If you're in the tri-state area or these states that the incredible establishment is operating, I highly recommend if you're a muffin or croissant or <laughs> We cookie, make it from scratch. It's really good shit. It's like for better or worse, we it's take it on really ourselves good. to be as vertically integrated as possible, control the supply chain, control quality. Everything we do, we make ourselves. So like in this drink, you have the pumpkin spice we make from scratch with pumpkin puree, real products, real ingredients. The chai, we brew ourselves. I don't milk the oats, I guess. Maybe that's the one thing I, I depend on other people to do with the oat milk, but... Dustin uh, milks oats yeah. a lot. <laughs> okay, yeah. So if anybody has got a great so Soaked oat milk that they think could work for me will work on it. But otherwise, we're trying to make everything ourselves. And we're really proud of everything you do. And we're really excited to be part of you. brother. I really wanted people to get to know your story. I hope you were inspired. I hope you took away one to three to four nuggets of insight, affirmation. I think you could tell now it makes sense to me why Gregory, from afar, knew this could be a good collaboration because he saw what I was talking about and we were doing uh, so much. I guess much. you could also see, find me. I mean, at Gregory Zamfotis, uh, my handles, I, I should probably talk yes, about myself yeah, sometimes say, too. I'm handle? so connected to the brand. I'm I like, yeah, it. yeah, Gregory's Coffee, Gregory's Coffee. What's like, yours? I'm just at Gregory Zamfotis. So, Spell that fucking, so, it's like a Vaynerchuk. Yeah, Gregory, like yeah, Gregory I, it's pretty straightforward, but we'll go G-R-E-G-O-R-Y, and then last name Zamfotis, Z-A-M-F-O-T-I-S. So 
Um, you never I'm thought about X. calling it Zamfotis? Like, you, you, Gregory was a better play? <laughs> One of my cousins took just the Zamfotis handle, so. And kind of went know, with it? Yeah, I Fucking let him have cousins. it. Uh, my father, I'm Greg, my father's George, he took G Zamfotis, so I'm like, you know, I'm, even <laughs> though I was early on all these things, I just, I had other weird names, like Coffee X Clothing and whatever, <laughs> now they're all just Gregory Zamfotis, so t awesome. X Twitter, whatever you call it. Uh, Instagram? Uh, Instagram. Do we get some clothing content on Maybe, Instagram? yeah, there's, there's some, probably a bunch of kids stuff. Good for uh, you, good for you. you. Know, but, You'll Thanks for being on, Vayner Nation. Thank you. Please, uh, this goes through the month of October, right? Yes, sir. Uh, in the month of October, get your ass to New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, or DC. Find a Gregory's and order loudly and proudly a Jolly Jacko pumpkin spice chai latte, cold or hot. Let us know on Twitter uh, at Gary V E E or at B Friends what you thought of it. Take a photo. I'm sharing a bunch of those. Get some followers out of this. Uh, hope you have a great day. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Good stuff, my man. Thank you. Nice.